Okay, so uh, we started this morning to answer questions about elders from the local congregation and uh, want to get to the last question of which I am currently aware about this, which has to do with the deacons. Uh, sorry, there's something stuck on my, on my mouse there. All right, here we go. The question is, how many, if any, deacons are required? Which, I guess, is a thought about if you're going to have elders, then shouldn't you also have deacons? Don't we read about elders and deacons? This is all uh, reasonable <clears throat> coming from a place of what, you know, what the Bible contains and talks about and refers to. So I think it should be treated that way as a, a good and a serious question. And so uh, the first question, I think, would be, are they required at all? Well, let's go back to the place where they were instituted, which is Acts chapter 6. And uh, the first thing I have to point out is that deacons are instituted in Acts chapter 6. And I have to point it out because it's not getting translated that way. Unfortunately, uh, on the one hand, um, they're not using a technical term for uh, serving, which would be deaconing, whatever that would mean. <laughs> so on the other hand, it's also good that they didn't go with deaconing because we would all be scratching our heads as to what that means. <laughs> uh, and all manner of deaconry. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense in uh, English, but I want to make it clear that the word deacon or the root deacon uh, literally is dia, that's why it's D-E-A, and con. And uh, dia is through, as in puncturing or through the middle of something, and con is dust. So a diacon, um, a deacon or a person who is doing the verb of deaconing, whatever that is is a person who goes through dust, a person who gets dirty, um, is the meaning of that. And so it is used for all kinds of serving. Um, it might refer to a waiter um, or an attendant. It might refer to, um, you know, a, a bus, a bus boy um, or, you know, dishwasher or something like this. It may refer to servants in a home, the ones who clean feet or the ones who chop wood or carry water, as uh, we talked about earlier today with the Israelites and uh, certain populations. Um, the idea, I think, from the concrete Greek idea of through dust is fairly clear. Like This is someone who gets dirty. They work with their hands. They do manual labor. Um, so, it is also used kind of generally for service, meaning you actually are getting your hands dirty. You're in the work itself um, doing something. And as such, it's a fairly common word in the New Testament, actually. Many people are called deacons. Uh, most infamously, Phoebe, the deaconess. <laughs> but there is no deaconess. There is no office of deaconess. Um, but there are many servants who are female. It's just the word servant, really, and uh, should have stayed that way probably instead of becoming deacon. <clears throat> and then somebody would say, well, then, but then how do you know the difference between a slave and, uh, you know, and a, and a waiter and a deacon? Well, the Greek doesn't help you with that. It's the same word for all of those. So just translate it and let us feel, let us deal with the problem. Right? That's the way they should be doing it. Uh, the Greek doesn't help there. They're just servants. But what you read in 6.2 of Acts is when um, there was a problem with the distribution for the widows at the care of the church, the apostles, the twelve, summoned the full number of the disciples, the whole, the whole church, and they said these things to them, 
it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now this word for to serve at table or to serve tables is deaconing. They, to deacon tables. To serve them. To, to be the waiter, if you will. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, that is, seven husbands of good repute. That's how we know there's no deaconess Phoebe. Full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Meaning the apostles, in their role as elders of the church in Jerusalem, are appointing deacons. They're appointing individual husbands, men of good repute, to oversee this duty. That's seven of them. But we, the apostles, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the deaconing of the word. That's a very interesting thing. There's a contrast there. It's the same um, deacon root. They said, it's not good for us, you know, the first time in, in verse 2, they said, it's, it's not good for us to give up preaching the word of God to deacon tables, to serve the tables. Give us seven names and we'll appoint these fellows to it. On the other hand, we'll devote ourselves to deaconing the word. So they're not serving tables, they're serving the Word of God. <laughs> but they're both serving. The elders are serving the same way that deacons are serving. But the elders' service is a spiritual one. They're devoted to prayer and ministry of the Word, or preaching of the Word, as they said in verse 2. It's, that's not right for the apostles to leave off the spiritual work. It's now time for the deacons you know, to deal with, in these physical matters. They're important physical matters. You know, don't get the idea that the apostles are saying, oh, this is beneath us. Uh, we, we won't deign to get our hands dirty with this matter. That's not what they're saying. They're saying there's a difference between the spiritual work and the physical work, and they are actually both of them important enough to warrant having somebody assigned and responsible for it. That's what they're saying. We will be devoted to prayer. Our deaconing will be of the word. They will be devoted to the tables, that is the physical business. Their deaconing will be of the food uh, for the widows, among other things, obviously, whatever might arise. And actually, as you look at this term and its use throughout the New Testament, you see it um, being used for individuals who are messengers of churches. Some of those who carry the, uh, the gift to Jerusalem are described as deacons or doing the work of deaconing. Onesimus, uh, in the letter to Philemon, the slave who obeyed the gospel in prison with Paul, when Paul asked to keep him there, it was to serve me on your behalf, that is to deacon me on your behalf, <laughs> provide for his physical needs while he's in jail. Um, so you see it all over the place. Um, throughout the New Testament for all manner of service. But Acts 6 is where the apostles are establishing what we would call an office. There is a defined work that is to be done that is part of the work of the church local. Uh, and I would bring also, I think it's wisdom, to look at Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. They are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. When you put this together, especially with Acts 20, when Paul speaks to the elders there at Ephesus, you know they are keeping watch. They are keeping watch. They are accountable for the flock that is among them. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And I realize that he's talking here about our spirits, our, you know, how we treat them whether we are respectful, whether we listen, whether we are easy to get along with or make trouble, complaining all the time, whatever. I understand that, but it's also true, if you think about it, that um, there's a lot of work that has to be done in any local congregation. And the differentiation of the spiritual from the physical as it is an important thing, having your leaders do both at the same time might be groaning. And would certainly be of no advantage. Uh, there's no reason for us to 
uh, think that it's going to go better if if the people who are supposed to be watching our souls and teaching us, picking good materials and good teachers, coming by and checking on us in the spirit, if they're busy with, you know, finding another hotel space for us to meet in or, you know, finding, you know, another provider for songbooks or something. It doesn't make sense for them to be focused on those, which are important things and necessary, and somebody should be on point. But that's just pulling them away from a work that we really need. So it seems to me that the reason for which deacons exist at all, and the reason for which deacons and elders are separated in their duties from one another, is still with us. So I would say wisdom dictates that yes you're going to appoint deacons quickly uh, clearly they met and they continued to meet for some time before this problem arose and they realized they needed to institute deacons um, so you know it can't be absolutely wrong to appoint elders and not have deacons standing right next to them to be appointed at the exact same time. But I think wisdom tells us we should do so, and we should do so fairly quickly. If we succeed in establishing an eldership, those elders should relatively quickly get somebody busy on these physical matters that are of great importance in the local work. All right, so there's that. That seems like it's fairly clear that, yeah, the reason for which they were brought into being is still a valid reason. And so, yes, you probably should still do that fairly quickly. Now, on the other hand, <clears throat> how many deacons do you need is a good question. It's true that in a strictly, <clears throat> in a strictly literal interpretation, Looking at 1 Timothy 3.8 and Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, th these are the only two places I know of where we definitely refer to the husbands, the aforementioned husbands, who are serving in the office of deacon in the local church. Um, there are lots of uses of the word deacon, like I said, because it's just a general word for servant. Um... But these two verses, I think, are the only two you can point to and say this definitely refers to the office of deacon, men who are serving in the office of deacons. And uh, they both occur in the plural. It's true. So deacons are, are being qualified at 1 Timothy 3.8, and in that case, it's difficult. Um, I think it's difficult to require a plurality just from that mention. And the same is true at Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. There's a church at Philippi. The church there has overseers, and the church there has deacons too. Yeah, it's true that they literally both say deacons, and that's definitely a plural word, and they, they must have had more than one deacon at Philippi. Um, but it does seem to be incidental. Um, not really the substance of either one of these passages. They're not about... How many of these guys do you have? It's about the fact that you have somebody devoted to this work that needs to be done. It seems to be incidental. And let me go a little bit further with that. Um, we know for sure that the elders are required to be in plurality. There has to be more than one elder because there are rules set forth in 1 Timothy that govern how elders are dealt with in a local church. And in 1 Timothy 5, the evangelist is charged um, with this command at verse 20. As for those elders who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all the elders so that the rest of the elders may stand in fear. So you, you have to have more than one elder in order for this to work. You can't fulfill 1 Timothy 5.20 if you don't have more than one elder. There is no you have one that persists in sin, he must be rebuked before the others, and the rest will stand in fear as well, not of Timothy, but of God. It, it can't be done with only one elder. That's fairly clear 
that you got to have a plurality of them in order for this to be accomplished. But there is no rule like this given for deacons. They're not being dealt with in this way. And you get to thinking about it, well, uh, or I get to thinking about it, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't accuse you all of being the weirdo that I am. But in my strange mind, I get to thinking about, well, do we have any math? <laughs> do we have any math here at all? And we do in the book of Acts. And what you find there, <clears throat> I was surprised at what I found in this study. And I found it interesting, um, which is neither here nor there, I guess. But I was surprised when I realized that the ratio was much lower, the ratio of deacons to members, if you will, is, is much, much lower, um, or I guess much higher, is what I should have said. Um, the number of members per deacon is much higher than I was originally thinking that it was. Now I'll show you. So you start in Acts chapter 2. It's not difficult math. Um, we find in Acts 2.41 that those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And at 47th verse, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, so first place is verse 41 there of Acts 2. The day of Pentecost, the first day of the church, 3,000 souls were added. Now, I've, I've highlighted the word souls here because a soul is a human life. This is not just males, and it's not just adult males. This is just people. About 3,000 people obeyed the gospel on Acts, in Acts 2 and on Pentecost. Some portion of those 3,000 people must have been adult males, but not 3,000 of them. Right? This is just souls, people, some mixture. And it says the Lord was adding daily, day by day, to the number, those who were being saved. So whoever obeyed the gospel was continually added to the number. So it, it starts to grow, it starts to trickle, perhaps, or maybe not trickle. <laughs> <coughs> When you get to the next place where a number appears, it's Acts 4 and verse 4, which says many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. And this word for men is different from Acts 2, 41, souls. Souls are just human lives, male and female, adult and maybe adolescent. But Acts 4 says the number of the men, and this man is husbands, husband, father, soldier, really. If, if you're going to go classical Greece, right, the aner, or andros, andra, however you want to decline that, um, refers to the presence of testosterone in an adult, and therefore refers to... Um, for example, a soldier as opposed to just an adult male human. <laughs> Which famously happens in the Battle of Thermopylae, you know, in the Spartan 300, all that kind of stuff. One of the reports that comes back to Xerxes, you may not be familiar with the story, I'll just tell you, 300 Spartans were holding off a force of about 15,000 Persians. Which is crazy. And when the Persian king asked, how goes the battle, they told him, you have a lot of adult males, but only a few soldiers. And it's this on air. <laughs> you got a lot of, you know, a lot of men, but few men. <laughs> that's really what it means. <laughs> and that's probably true. If they were, if 300 were holding off 15,000, they were not very manly, were <laughs> they, their soul, their spirit was not in it. Well, the purpose of my pointing this out is to say 
we have shifted from the entire population being 3,000 people, men, women, and adolescents, to just the number of the adult males, whether they're soldiers, husbands, fathers, however you want it, depending on the context. That's the same word that's used for deacons in, in Acts 6 when they say, choose out seven husbands from among you. It's that Andra, Andra that testosterone-laden, adult male. Um, 5,000 adult males came to be the number. This is a lot more. Only the men are being counted. The number of souls must have been greater than 5,000. That's what we're saying. The souls who obeyed were 3,000 in Acts 2. The husbands, if you will, by Acts 4, number 5,000. In chapter 5, at verse 14, it says, More than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And it's the same word for men as we just read in Acts 4, 4, and as we will read in Acts 6. So both husbands and wives, or men and women, adult males and adult females. But it says more than ever they were added to the Lord in Acts 5.14. So we had 5,000 husbands in chapter 4. Now it says more than ever they're being added multitudes of men and of women. So that's more than 5,000 husbands. How much more, I'm not sure. Um, in Acts 6... We are also told at verse 1 that it was at this time or in these days that the disciples were increasing in number. So we read that more than ever, multitudes were being added. And now in Acts 6, 1, the disciples continue to increase in number. It just keeps going up. It's at this point in Acts 6, verse 3, that the apostles said, Pick out from among you seven husbands, seven adult males whom we will appoint to this service, seven deacons. So if you think about it like that, you realize the number is quite large, actually. Uh, the number of men in Acts 4.4 was 5,000. But Acts 5.14 tells us that it had grown, and it's growing by an unknown amount. So that's the question mark in our math right now. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. First of all, I want to address what it says in Acts 5.14, more than ever. This is a rate of growth. The rate of growth is higher than it has ever been. But the rate of growth in the congregation was already astonishing. From 3,000 population on the day of Pentecost to 5,000 husbands, in Acts 4.4, 4. and then 5.14 says it was growing at a greater rate still. But from 2.41 at 3,000 total population to 4.4, 4, 5,000 just subset of the population, the husbands. That's an astonishing rate of growth. Even if you think to yourself, well, you know, Pentecost was likely to be mostly male, uh, maybe two out of three people there were adult males. Even if you did that, that'd be 2,000 adult males who increased to 5,000 by 4.4. 4. That's more than doubled. Easily more than doubled. Um, you know, saying that two-thirds of the original Pentecostal uh, uh, um, Christians were uh, husbands and fathers is probably an overestimate. That's probably too much. Okay, but even if you go with 2,000, right, they've more than doubled their number. And if you go with 2,500 of them, they've doubled it, right? That's, a, that's an astonishing rate of growth is what we're saying already. And yet, Acts, I'm sorry, from 2.41 to 4.4. And Acts 5.14 uh, says the rate of growth was more than ever. So they're growing at an even faster rate by the fifth chapter than they had already seen between 2 and 4. Then Acts 5.14 also says... The number of people added is multitudes. What does that mean? It means we stopped counting. <laughs> you know, we counted 3,000, we counted 5,000. At some point you get tired of counting. 
Yeah, multitudes. Bunches of them. <laughs> a lot. So an additional 5,000 husbands, say by 514, would be comparable to the rate of growth between 2 and 4. Because between Acts 2 and Acts 4, they doubled. Between Acts 5 and Acts... Or I'm sorry, between 4 and 5, if the... Uh, if it was more than ever, well, maybe doubling is a rational number. That'd be 10,000 husbands by that rate, and that'd be conservative. That'd be conservative, because they grew by a lot between Acts 2 and Acts 4, and they grew a lot faster in Acts 5.14. So it's conservative to say that they doubled when it says it was more than ever. And when before they talked about 3,000 and 5,000, and now they won't bother. <laughs> you know, if they could tell you another 5,000 were added, or it increased to 8 or something, they probably would have, but they stopped counting. It's multitudes, more than ever. This is telling us, right, that if the, the count of the husbands alone, let's say it's 10,000 of them, you know, for every husband, adult male in a population, how many people are there? Right? There's going to be some unmarried women. There's going to be some unmarried men. There's going to be men who have only a wife, no, no children. There's going to be men who have a wife and whatever, 13 children. Right? Some number, like two to three times as many of them, is a reasonable estimate. But at this point, I understand we're just estimating. <laughs> but it's a very reasonable thing to say, well, if you got this many husband, father, you know, soldier, adult males, it's probably two or three times that number is the total population. Maybe it's more than that. I don't know enough about population st statistics of the ancient Near East, of the scattered um, uh, Hebrews returning to, you know, to worship on Pentecost. I don't know, but it seems reasonable to say it would be two or three times that size, at least. For every husband, you probably bring in two or three people. I guess if we counted it tonight, we got three husbands and what? Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got uh, three, so that's four, four to one on, on that ratio. Um, so, you know, two or three times as much is, is reasonable. If we had 5,000, we grew by at least as much. That's 10,000 husbands. Two or three times, maybe even four times, you're looking at twenty to 40,000 people in the congregation. It was huge. You think about it. If you ignore all the growth from Acts 4.4 and say, well, we don't know because it doesn't give us a number in Acts 5, even though it said it was growing faster than ever and the number of people was beyond counting. It would not really be right to ignore that number. But even if you did, then seven deacons out of five, you know, seven husbands are chosen to be deacons out of 5,000 husbands. That's one in every 714 husbands. I mean, that's a lot of people. 700 people. And that's not, that's not the people. That's the husbands. That doesn't include the wives and the children. If we say there's 10,000 men, and that's conservative, because there were five, and the rate of growth was higher, and they had more than doubled between two and four, 10,000 is conservative estimate. But if you do that, then the ratio is one deacon for every 1,400 men. Um, why are we doing this? Because we're asking, I mean, because the question is, how many deacons do you have to have? You know, it looks like the original assignment has a deacon for hundreds of people, if not thousands of people. Um, it seems like that being the case, and I don't think that there's a lot of arguing this. It, there's no indication that they shrank or came down in size at any point in time uh, between Acts 2 and Acts 6. At no point does it talk about it getting down. In fact, in Acts 6.1, it says they're still increasing in number. Um, 
you got a deacon for hundreds or thousands of people. And uh, that's telling me that you don't have to have a whole lot of them. Somebody has to be paying attention to this, but it doesn't have to be a team of, of you know, a dozen fellows in a congregation of 60. Somebody has to attend to the physical business of the church. That's true. You've got to have somebody who is assigned. Um, but one deacon for a group of our size seems to be well attested in the Acts. There seems to be plenty of support for the idea that one deacon would suffice. When you look at what they did, I understand that the letters um, don't really refer to deacons very often at all. There's the two verses we saw, both of those talk in the plural. Um, but when you look at the Acts and you see what was happening in terms of the growth of the church, and when these uh, deacons were put into place, and, and why? No, it's it seems very reasonable that a group our size does not have to appoint more than one deacon. While it seems still to be wise to differentiate the spiritual from the physical, I don't think you'd go without any deacons at all. I think... It, you, it would be hard to say, well, you have to have enough fellows that you can appoint two or three of these guys. Uh, I mean, in the book of Acts, that would be enough for several thousand people. I, I don't think we can enjoin that upon the local congregation. Um, it's good to have responsibility. It's good to have a name. You know, the other thing that we have talked about in the past with regard to service, and, and I, it's a little bit of field talking about the deacons, but these numbers are also supporting the, the same idea there that the deacon is not necessarily doing everything himself. In fact, it seems clear that he can't do everything himself. It isn't his job to take care of the physical needs and and visit and feed all the widows in a population of two to three thousand people every single day he he can't do it he doesn't have time to do that um, it seems clear that when the apostles say we are pointing them to this duty what we what they mean by that is they are on point. They are responsible. Um, in some sense, they're overseeing that work. Not that they are taking the place of elders or that they're undercutting elders, but that they are supervisors. They're managers, um, directors, perhaps you would say. That they aren't necessarily doing everything that has to be done themselves. Their job is or must include delegation. <laughs> so if, if we have deacons in this place, I, will, I would not expect that those deacons are going to do all of the work. If you got a property and they have to maintain, there's maintenance, I don't expect that they're going to do all of the maintenance themselves. They're going to mow, they're going to do electric, electrical, they're going to do plumbing, whatever. No, I don't think so. Um... In a, in a local church, you have needs. There are people who need support, who need help. There are, you know, songbooks, there's set up, there's, right, there's so many physical things. I do not expect that every one of those things is going to be done by a deacon while the rest of us just, you know, stand by or lean back. <laughs> um, you know, as everybody's first manager said, you got time to lean, you got time to clean. The deacon's job is going to be, hey, you there, I think that I have something that you can do. <laughs> and when they do that, and their office is deacon, well, I have to do it. Because they have the authority to assign. That's what they do. They can't do everything. And they shouldn't be expected to do everything. They're invested with the authority to get things done. So, we have 
very often, and it's nothing unusual, but we have very often uh, people will volunteer to do things like, I can find another hotel, or I can help negotiate this contract, or I can put together um, a, uh, a directory or whatever it is. That sounds great, and that's a good thing to do. The fact that we have deacons, if we, if we put a deacon in, the existence of a deacon doesn't prevent you from doing those things. It just means that somebody is in charge of that and keeping track of it. The elders might task the deacons with, we need a directory. We need a way for people to be in contact with one another. And the deacons maybe will decide, well, is that a directory? Is that a phone tree? Is that whatever it is? But they'll be responsible for, we need this. And we need it by this time. Put something into place to make sure that we can do this. And they'll do it. And whatever they choose, that's what it's going to be because they're the deacons. And that's the idea behind this. And I'm getting this from the fact that you got seven of them in a congregation of some 20 to 40 or maybe more, a thousand people. They can't possibly be doing everything themselves. They're managing it. They're in charge. They might assign something to other members, and that is okay. That's well within the confines of authority that the scriptures lay out. So I hope that this is a useful answer to the question. I think we do need deacons. Um, we do need somebody responsible. Somebody who gives an answer for making sure that we can do things that we need to do that are in the physical dimension. That is true. You do need to have that. Do you have to have a plurality? I don't see that you have to have that given what the New Testament shows to be the ratio at that time is far greater than our current need. However, there's no indication that Philippi had that many members, and yet they have deacons, and, or yeah, they have deacons in a plurality, so I wouldn't say, no, you can't appoint them. But it seems safe to say one person can serve as deacon, and that will be okay until it's not, until you need more. Sorry, my mouse is sticky. Uh, let me try. Uh, okay. So, those are the questions that I am aware of. Um, by all means, let me know other questions that you have or other things that we have not addressed or anything that I may have gotten wrong. Um, I do the studies new every time, and uh, you know, I'm trying to to be faithful in thinking through these things and and looking through the scriptures and coming to the right conclusions from them. Uh, but certainly, I'm not infallible. If you get something wrong, let me know. If you see something here that's a, an error in scripture. Uh, be happy to look at that. I appreciate knowing that, but these things that I present, though, I don't present as as opinion. I, I've found these to be the case and to to uh, measure to the measure up to the test of Scripture. And yet, I'm willing to listen. So let me know. And if there are other questions that we haven't addressed, let that be known, and we'll try to get to those at the next appointed opportunity, so that you might be able to decide whom you might nominate to serve in the office of elders and perhaps after that in the office of deacons all right thank you for your kind attention we speak at this time and every time that we come together as god's children about salvation about forgiveness of sins about the fact that Jesus gave his life that you and I might be saved that they were baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins and that they by doing so were added to the number of the saved that God considered them his children 
that is also not changed from the first century. So we today uh, will have water ready for you to obey the gospel if that is your need and you realize that. If today you have been a Christian and have not been walking faithfully, let us pray for you. Um, we made mention of a brother who is uh, restored this afternoon, and that is a good thing and a right thing and not a, a place of shame. It is a place of rejoicing because we're glad when any soul turns back, when any soul regrets what has been done that is a sin and that is a shameful thing and is willing to uh, to admit that and turn back and do the right thing. It's encouraging. It's, it's a shot in the arm. So... By all means, let us build each other up in this regard. If you need our prayers, or if you need to be baptized, let your need be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.